Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's go back to the episode when shortly after you assumed office at C at the uh, as CFPB director and with it the ex officio role on the FDIC board, you and now interim Chairman Grunberg began orchestrating your hostile takeover of the FDIC board. Now, I understand that at the time you circulated a document purporting to provide a legal justification for bypassing the chairman and moving matters to a vote. Did the FDIC general counsel write that document? Uh, so with respect to the legal justification around board members' responsibilities, um, the bylaws are obviously public. The legislation is obviously public. Uh, okay. The but FDIC I'm general counsel question. did not provide any legal justification for any interpretation. Okay. But so you acknowledge that you did distribute a document purporting to provide a legal basis for this? Uh, yes. So okay. based now, on I, the... I've got very limited okay. time. Sorry. So let me move on. Let me ask you this. Did Todd Phillips or anybody at the Center for American Progress contribute to the drafting of this legal document, to your no. knowledge? They did not. Um, so who did? So uh, the general counsels of all of the agencies involved in the board were obviously concerned about the lack of legal justification proffered by the FDIC's general counsel. We also understand the FDIC's general counsel muzzled um, many of the okay, career staff I asked staff a simple question. Who, who, who worked on drafting so the, this the, document? The general counsels and legal advisors okay, so of the CFPB the, and the OCC. And the OCC general counsels. Since 1933, the FDIC board had a history of trying to work collaboratively without partisan political influence. As Chairman McWilliams has stated, when you demanded the FDIC issue an RFI relating to bank merger policies, the chairman expressed a willingness to work with you. You submitted a draft the FDIC found was filled with omissions, misrepresentations, and technical inaccuracies, and they drafted a version reflecting their expertise. But then you forced an unprecedented and illegitimate vote on your draft, disregarding the draft that reflected the expertise and knowledge of the staff at the FDIC. But I have to say, I have difficulty believing that you tore down the FDIC's rules and norms simply over a question of the wording of a merger RFI, particularly because a few months previously, the Center for American Progress began to very publicly urge Democrats to seize unprecedented control of the FDIC board in order to eliminate all obstacles to Democrats' radical agenda. Your and your Democrat colleagues' actions smacked of a planned partisan power grab to enact this agenda, and your politicization of the FDIC has done lasting damage to its independence and its credibility as a financial regulator. Now, I want to get to this UDAP expansion to disparate impact. In fact, Senator, is, may I, I respond to... I, I'm, I'm going to run out of time, so I... I but actually, uh, you've leveled quite a... And I don't believe any of it is in, in accordance with the facts, and I think it's well, only Well, as long fair. as I'll get time to ask my second question. So when it comes to process... There was long an established process for 90 years about how the board operates. Sometimes Congress has changed the composition of the board. Every single process was followed, and what we heard back was staff is not going to be able to talk to you, disrupting all of the norms about how career staff engage. This was unbelievable and sad, and honestly, we have to be committed to upholding the rule of law on how these agencies are governed. We cannot simply make up the fact that a chair can overrule a supermajority okay. of the board. Well, your, your version of the events is extremely different from the version of, of others, and so um, this is not a, a productive uh, path to go down. Let me move on to this recent expansion, unprecedented expansion of UDAP. It, this month, CFPB announced that it would extend disparate impact theory to cover all financial services, effectively reversing Congress's legislative decisions. And as I noted in my opening statement, this is also at odds with over a century of FTC precedent on UDAP. The FTC did not use UDAP to pursue disparate impact before the Dodd-Frank Act created the CFPB and gave it the same authority the FTC had to pursue, quote, unfair or deceptive acts or practices. What's more, if the FTC already had blanket authority to prohibit discrimination and disparate impact for a century, 
Congress would have had no need to enact the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, or other targeted laws it passed to address discrimination. But Congress did enact those measures, precisely because UDAP does not already address these harms. Given that disparate impact is a contested but well understood policy with far reaching consequence, if Congress had intended to give that power to the CFPB, it would have done so explicitly. Equally concerning is the way the CFPB made this unprecedented change. When an agency imposes new substantive requirements on regulated entities, the Administrative Procedure Act requires it to conduct a transparent notice and common rulemaking, taking public comment into account and explaining the legal and policy basis for the change. In this instance, the CFPB simply updated its manual to instruct examiners to apply this new policy when conducting supervisions. And because the CFPB didn't engage in rulemaking, there's now significant regulatory uncertainty regarding the implementation of the new rule. Without a rule, it's unclear how financial institutions are supposed to implement disparate impact and what universe of business decisions they now have to run through a gamut of regression analysis. The cost of regulatory uncertainty include reduced innovation and market paralysis, which only harms consumers in the long run. So obviously you made the decision not to conduct a rulemaking. Let me ask you, did anyone in your legal or regulatory department suggest that you shouldn't proceed this way because it might conflict with the Administrative Procedures Act? So Senator, I take these procedural questions very seriously as a matter of law and policy. To be clear, <clears throat> if we receive complaints that suggest that, for example, someone is being discriminated against and not being given a bank account. The compliance manual is a transparency tool, essentially giving the financial institution what the test is. We give them exactly what we would be looking for in order to ascertain their compliance management system and their adherence to existing you, law. You, you've there is decades totally ignored of my precedent. Question. Well, let me get to it. There are decades of precedent about the application of the unfairness standard, which dates back to the 1930s. There have been in many instances where the prongs have been analyzed for a wide range of conduct and certainly discriminating against someone based on their race to open a bank account would meet those threats. So I don't know exactly what you're referring to in terms of- No, I think you know exactly say, what I am referring to. No, I don't, this, please. This, you, do, what, at what occasion in the hundred and some odd years at the FTC was UDAP ever used as a justification for using disparate impact? That, that's not what is in the manual, yes, respectfully. Yes, it is. That is not what is uh, in the manual. And, I'm happy to take didn't questions answer my for question, the record. As you said uh, you would about whether anyone in your legal or regulatory department suggested that you follow the Administrative Procedures Act and actually have a rulemaking. Not to my recollection. They didn't. Hey, thank you.